I gave myself bangs during this pandemic because I wanted to look more like Kira Knightley and Pride and Prejudice. Oh my goodness, is that ser- are you? Is that what? Uh, That's one hundred percent. You can ask any of my you? friends. I would like. I talked about it. I mean, like, I wanted. Ba- it wasn't solely that, but I was like, I I think I want to give myself bangs. And I want to look like Kieran Knightley in Brad and Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I like bangs, but I, w- I just want to be Kieran Knightley. Hello, and welcome to My Favorite Movie Is, a podcast all about why we love our favorite movies. I'm your host, Larry Freed, and for today's episode, we are talking to YouTube and TikTok comedian, singer, actress, writer, podcaster, my goodness, Katie Siegel, about one of her many favorite movies, the 2005 film adaptation, of Pride and Prejudice. I do have vivid memories of listening to the soundtrack of the movie a lot during my freshman year of college, wandering around Douglas campus, um, listening to the Pride and Prejudice soundtrack, just like vibing and like feeling like the main character. We talk extensively about director Joe Wright and his process and decisions and stylistic choices, and also gush about this wonderful, cast of actors who bring to life such a beautiful cast of characters. This is just one of those movies that makes you feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside, and so it was just so much fun to get to revisit it with my good friend Katie to boot. Before we go any further, be warned. We are going way past the red tape and deep into spoilers on this movie, as we do with every movie on this show. So if you haven't seen Pride and Prejudice already, go watch the movie, love it like we did, and then come back and listen to this awesome discussion. That being said, if you haven't seen this movie and are still looking for an episode of MFMI, we have a great conversation with my friend Max Mariner all about Back to the Future. I mean, you've seen Back to the Future, right? Gosh, I hope so. Uh, Check out that episode if you haven't seen Pride and Prejudice. But for those of you who have seen Pride and Prejudice, you're in for a real treat. Katie, take it away. My name is Katie Siegel, and my favorite movie is 2005's Pride and Prejudice. Katie Siegel, welcome to my favorite movie is. Now it is opening up the water. We're already off to a fantastic start. Katie, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. How's it going? Great. Pleasure to be here. Katie and I uh, have been friends and collaborators for a number of years now. It's always a pleasure to talk to Katie. And so when I asked her if she wanted to be a part of the show and I had to ask her what her favorite movie was, there are a number of answers to this question. But the one that you gave uh, for the show was Pride and Prejudice. This might be hard because based on our previous conversations about this film, it sounds like you have watched it many, many times. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. But can you recall the way in which you discovered this film, the way you found it, and what it was like when you watched it for the first time? So I, I'm pretty sure it was, like, around my freshman year of college because I just have, like, I do have, I don't have a memory of watching it for the first time, but I do have vivid memories of listening to the soundtrack of the movie a lot during my freshman year of college. We both went to Rutgers. I lived on Douglas campus my first uh, year at Rutgers and I just like have a lot of memories of just like wandering around Douglas campus um, listening to the Pride and Prejudice soundtrack just like vibing and like feeling like the main character for those who don't know Douglas campus is very green very green there's a pond there's a you walk around it you sit by passion puddle and you just feel you know like Lizzie Bennett yeah 100% you could frolic you can frolic through Douglas campus great frolicking campus <laughs> great for, for Douglas campus great for frolicking my um, gateway drug into Pride and Prejudice was actually with a web series called The Lizzie Bennet Diaries, um, which was actually produced by Hank Green. And it was basically like a modern adaptation of Pride and Prejudice told like in, on YouTube. It was a web series format. And I think before or at least like while I was watching that, I attempted to read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And I just like couldn't get into it. I didn't understand what was going on. You know, I didn't I was never one to read like classics. So I just like I didn't have like the mental capacity to like concentrate and focus on the dialogue and understand like the plot and what was happening. So I like, just like gave up on that. Once I got into the Lizzie Bennet Diaries and probably like once I finished watching it. So I got the whole story. I remember going back to Pride and Prejudice and reading it and I loved it since I knew the story and I understood now like what was going on based on like watching the web series like it was so much easier to like understand the book and read it and enjoy it and then like the rest was history and then like at some point along the way I was like let's check out what else is out there Pride and Prejudice like watch the there's the TV series with Colin Firth which is a lot of people's favorite and it's you know good and then I watched the Keira Knightley uh movie and that is my 
fave. I think there is another movie. Yeah, at least there one are other a couple. Movie. Yeah, there older. Are a couple. Much, yes. We're talking much, about Kira Knightley. Older. Yes. <laughs> we are talking about Kira Knightley. No, we're just talking about Kira Knightley. In keeping in line with like sort of like experiencing the film, has there ever been a time that you've watched this film and it changed for you in some way or you experienced something new or saw something different? Or maybe it was just like I experienced it in this one specific way and that really like stuck out for me. Do you have any experiences like that? It was the, well, I guess it wasn't the last time I watched it because the last time I watched Pride and Prejudice was actually last night in preparation for this, which I actually, I watched it for the, I think this is the first time I've watched it with the director's commentary on. Oh, um, really? Because we were talking about Joe Wright and I was like, okay, let's see what Joe has to say. <laughs> um so that was really funny we could talk about that later if we want but i'd love to hear before that. that the last time i watched it was with our mutual friend nicole nicole didn't doesn't really watch a lot of stuff but she watched bridgerton and she really liked it so i was like if you like bridgerton i really think you'll like pride and prejudice we watched it and i had like a whole i have all these like video we're like on we're watching this like on zoom together and i have all these like videos of all of her she got so into it she had all these reactions i have all these like reaction <laughs> gifts of nicole like reacting to, like oh certain things and i got to the point where like because sometimes like after a scene she would be like wait can we pause and i'd be like, okay and she'd be like okay what just happened and then I had to explain it. But then I got to the, but then I said it and she was like, okay, I got that. I got that. Didn't get that. Great. Let's keep going. And then I got to the point where like a scene would happen and then I would pause it and I would be like, okay, Nicole, like tell me what you think just happened. And she'd be like, okay. She just found out that Darcy was the one who told Bingley to leave or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I was like so proud. I felt like a proud parent. <laughs> I felt like a teacher <laughs> teaching a student. Like you yeah, got I it. Literally, before that like big reveal scene happens, like in the church, I'm like, I'm like, okay, pay attention. Like I knew she was paying attention, but yeah. I was like, really listen. Cause I think you can get this if you listen to the dialogue and then she did and she like gave the like i was saying like the spark notes she was giving like the spark notes version of what just happened and i was like so proud of her it's not oh that God. difficult to understand like really like, i don't I'm, think so you know, either but like that language is a little like it just if you're not just the concentrating syntax and grammar yeah if you're not concentrating you can lose it a little bit um and i, I think people for people who are familiar with the story it's easy for them to be like no it's so easy but like if you don't know the story at all it's that it's not as easy as you might think but i was very proud of nicole for for getting it so and it was just fun and she loved it and it was just really great to see that me being right i love being right um it's a it's a it's a great <laughs> feeling right it, that was just it's just really fun to watch your friends enjoy a movie that you really love especially for the first time oh a hundred percent and it's like it's incredible how these moments you take them for granted after you've seen a movie so many times and then you see someone else experience them. There's nothing, there's no greater feeling than than getting someone to experience a film that you love and then them also loving it. Because it's like you can also live vicariously through them because it's like you'll never be able to experience watching your favorite movie again for the first time, but like you can watch them do it and it's like almost the same feeling. That's why I don't try to watch... Me and you may be a little bit different about this, but I try not to watch my favorite movies too often. Like even cannot relate. Yeah, you cannot relate. But like even like my favorite films of all time, like I will only watch them like once or twice a year, if that. Because like you want to re be able to revisit this film, and you want to be able to like see new things, and you want to be able to like discover things and if you watch too many times i feel like you might it might become a bit like a robot you're kind of like i know this is happening i know this is happening and i think uh and this kind of beautifully segues into pride and prejudice it had been a while since i had seen it and there were so many things about this film that i like had never noticed before or never thought about before that were really great to to um to experience and revisit this movie is so much about its characters and its relationships. Um, do you have a favorite uh, character in the film? Oh, Lizzie Bennet. Lizzie Hands Bennett. Down. I'll do be basic. I don't care. It's true. It's the truth. <laughs> do you see yourself in Lizzie Bennet? Yeah, hell yeah. So I, much enthusiasm. It's I can't lie. That's what it is. <laughs> I gave myself bangs during this pandemic because I wanted to look more like Kira Knightley in Pride and Prejudice. Oh my goodness, is that serious? Are you? Is that what? Uh, one hundred percent. You can ask any of my you? friends. I would like. I talked about it. That is <laughs> that is amazing, and I'm so glad we're talking about this film now that that was actually behind it. I mean, like I wanted. It wasn't solely that, but I was like, I I think I want to give myself bangs. And I want to look like Kira Knightley in Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I like bangs. But I, I just want to be Kieran Knightley. The bangs are a character in and of themselves. Yeah, truly. They're so wispy and just like 
perfectly framed in every shot. Yeah. What is it about Lizzie Bennet that that speaks to you or that you see yourself in her? She's just cool. She likes to read books. She's really like sharp witted. From the first moment I met you, your arrogance and conceit, your selfish disdain for the feelings of others made me realize that you were the last man in the world I could ever be prevailed upon to marry. I mean, she's just that classic literary gal that I think many girls and women and people in general just want to be like. That's like something about the film that's really interesting is that like it is obvious it obviously takes place um in old century England and it's very uh it is very stylized in that way and it looks like it could take place in the period but it is also incredibly modern it's it's so easy for you to sort of just jump up, jump into the film and i think a part of that is the comedy uh you know the sort of like the really sharp lines that get sent back and forth and like speaking about lizzie in particular god elizabeth has these lines where you just like she just like Boom! There's like moments where you're like mic drops, like especially with Darcy, where you're just like, man, I wish I could have a line that good. I wish I could drop a line that good. The first time I saw him at the assembly, he danced with nobody at all, even though gentlemen were scarce and there was more than one young lady sitting down without a partner. I knew nobody beyond my own party. Oh, and nobody can be introduced in a ballroom. We saw this a bit in the in the Pirates of the Caribbean films as well, which I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean is one of my all time favorite movies. The first one, she just she has such like the facial expression she gives, whether it's like a smile and cockiness or if it's like a, like a actually more raw, you really see it in her face. And she juxtaposes that really well with the moments where she's like, where she's actually being genuine when she's like crying and things like that. She gives such a fantastic performance in this film. I think it's when she, she was like at Pemberley and then she like spies on, uh, Darcy and Georgiana and then gets caught and then she's running and then he calls after her and then they stop there yes, and they yes. just like have that little awkward conversation. I think it's like that conversation where she's like, she keeps like smiling like she'll she's like so like clearly nervous and she'll like stop and then she'll like say something and smile really big and then like look down again. Maybe that sticks out to me because it's so overt whereas her facial expressions are usually like a lot more subtle but it's like so good and I feel like because of that it kind of shows like how much like the character is putting on a face because usually her face is not that big she's not like she smiles but like she's it's clearly so forced like she's trying to put on a front um because she just wants to run away <laughs> i don't know if anyone said this before but Kieran knightley is great Kieran knightley is great we will say it for the first time on this podcast Kieran knightley great Kieran knightley we've decided is she's great now yeah, only truly only underrated. only just now Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this week's episode of My Favorite Movie Is. Uh, if you are, I hope that you'll check out the rest of our content, including the introduction to the podcast, as well as our first episode where we talk to Max Mariner about all things Back to the Future. Both of these things are available wherever you get your podcasts, so follow us, subscribe, hit that notification bell, do what you gotta do so you can stay updated on exactly when new episodes go live. New audio episodes go up every other Monday and new video episodes go up every other Friday. You can also stay updated by following us on our social media pages. We are at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We're going to post a lot of sneak peeks and fun bonus content on those platforms. So please follow us there. I'm using TikTok for the first time. I'm very scared. Please be gentle. And of course, for our full catalog of audio and video episodes, as well as more information about the show, check out our website, mfmipodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening to My Favorite Movie Is. And now, back to the show. I want to also talk about the rest of the cast in the film, who are all so fantastic. And it's really fun to watch this film because you have so much talent here that are giving earlier performances in their career that are so different than how they end up later on in their career. Something that was very interesting is when we were talking about this was Rosamund Pike, uh, who gives such a wonderful, very like light, simple, but really like cordial, which I guess is fitting, performance as Jane. And she's gorgeous. And she's gorgeous. No, no denying that. It's funny because after Gone Girl came out, I feel like a lot of people we're ready to peg Rosamund Pike in these roles where it's like she's like the badass girl boss or something, you know, like uh, and like cold and evil and maniacal. I care a lot, obviously, which just came out on Netflix, I feel like is really exploiting that. But when you watch her in this film, her her touch is so much more delicate. It's just really funny seeing this kind of dichotomy from her. And she's been in a ton of movies, obviously, but it's like. 
It was just so wonderful to see her give an earlier performance. I've only seen her in this. Um, which is which is really funny to me. So this is all I know from her. When I, when I was seeing all the trailers for I Care A Lot, I was like, whoa, this is different for me. What happened to Jane? But she's great. Interesting. Interesting. So here's a right fact um, that I got from a commentary. Right Bites, we'll call them. Uh, right Bites. Rosamund Pike and I'm blanking on his name, but the actor who plays Bingley dated before filming this movie. And Joe Wright brings that up in the director's commentary, like at, right after the proposal scene, and like is like he just like drops it. He's like, "Yeah, they dated before this." So he was like, "I think is very, uh, you know, bra- I don't know if he said brave, but he was like applauding Rosamund for like having to go through that scene, like being proposed to by her ex." So yeah, oh, props, my, props to her. Oh my goodness! Uh, are there any other performances in this movie that stick out to you? Any other uh, actors or actresses you maybe were familiar with before? Yeah, I think they're all great. Tom Hollander, who plays uh, Collins. Joe Wright had like so, there were so many moments that he was like, oh yeah, that was Tom just like deciding to do that. And that was Tom just deciding it. Like so many things. He like, there's like multiple scenes where he like has a flower. He like gives Lizzie a flower when he's like proposes. And he also has a flower before that in the party scene where he's like picking flowers off of it. There's also in that party scene, there's a moment where he is trying to get Darcy's attention. And then Darcy like turns or like doesn't hear him at first and then turns around. And it's like a little you know, comedic physical gag that he's like, Collins is so much shorter than him. Like that was apparently something that they came up with together. Like the flower things, that was all him. So that just like, made, it's it's funny because you don't appreciate it if you don't know that it was the actor who came up with it. But knowing that it's the actor who came up with it, you appreciate the actor so much for it, knowing that they like created, they had this huge part in creating these moments for their character. I think the MVP of this movie is Donald Sutherland. He's great. Let's talk about him. He is obviously an incredibly talented actor. I've seen him in a number of other things. But in this movie, I think he gives such an understated but great performance because like I feel like I mean I'm a sucker for like that character like the straight man in the in the room of of weirdos or wackos or something you know like the guy who's just like I'm too tired of this I'm, I already know what the right thing to do is I'm going to go home I'm, I want to go to bed you know like I'm, I'm a sucker for those characters but the great thing about Donald Sutherland is that like there's less of an air of like arrogance to it and more of like, I want to watch what's going on, but I also know what's right, but I'm still invested because I care about these people. Like there's more yeah, of like a he's warmth. not bored. He's not annoyed. He's yeah. just like vibing. Yeah. There's such a warmth to his character. And a few scenes in particular really stand out when she gets chased down by Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Well, really Mrs. Bennett. And then Mr. Bennett just sort of shows up later. It's like similar to Kira Knightley in the way that like he's just going between so many modes. He's going between the fatherly mode, but then he also cares about his kids, but he also has opinions. And then he ends it off with that really snarky, like, I would hate it if you married this person. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Mr. Bennett. And it's like, Yes, like I love, you know what, honestly, if I had to distill it, it would have to be the relationship between him and Keira Knightley in particular. The yeah, scene at the sure. end, Keira Knightley is talking to him about getting approval for Darcy to marry her. It's such a beautiful interaction and Donald Sutherland is crying at the end of it. And there's that great shot where Keira Knightley runs down, exits his office and it kind of like dollies in and it shows him crying there. It's like, he's like, if anyone comes calling for Kitty or Mary, I am quite at my leisure. Any young men come for Mary or Kitty, for heaven's sake, send them in. I'm quite at my leisure. Ugh, charming. I have a, I have a couple of so right charming. bites about that scene, if, you, if you're interested. <laughs> uh, specifically about, you didn't sign up for this one. I Can didn't sign up for the right bites, but I will take them in stride. When you're talking about him crying, apparently he cried every take of the scene that they did. Um, Two, there's a moment. So this is a specifically a thing that I like. I'm like, yes, like this is one of those subconscious things that like I I'm sure other people notice, but like I didn't even notice, but it just like solidifies these characters so much. They Lizzie and her father both do the same thing in that scene when they're both like kind of crying and laughing. They're both like kind of covering their mouths in the same way, which I think was just like a choice the actor made. And it's just like so cute because you just like see it's the kind of thing where you're like these two are related. These two are like so alike and they're just like. It's just that family moment where, like, not only are they having, like, a lovely father-daughter moment, but, like, you can see that they're father and daughter because they are, like, mm-hmm. acting the same. They have these same mannerisms. It's so sweet. The character of Mr. Bennett, um, it just that, like, at the beginning, he is kind of just, like, on the outside of this, like, chaos, this hurricane. I mean, the first, you know, the first scene of the movie is, like, just bustling the whole chaos of the house and all the girls and everything, and he's just kind of, like, on the edge, like, 
uh with his newspaper and then just like throughout the movie he kind of just like moves inward and inwards and then by the end with this conversation with lizzie he's like the heart of the whole the whole movie you can see how he like ties everyone together i think that this movie the emotional sincerity behind it all of these and it's from the very beginning i mean i want to get to that opening shot in just a second to talk more about right i mean we might as well get to the director at some point since we're talking about him so much but it, the emotional sincerity is so there immediately there's all these like there's this childlike wonder between the with the relationship between the sisters and it's all about love and romance and like it weirdly enough reminded me of films like um lord of the rings where, you know, obviously they're very different, but throughout the whole films, they're not afraid to just like laugh and be merry and really like have fun with themselves and acknowledge the silliness. I love those moments where Rosamund Pike and Keira Knightley just laugh together. It's so cute and so infectious. And I think Donald Sutherland is a part of that because that moment at the end is him just sort of giving into the sincerity. Even, even this, even the father who like knows what he's doing and like, you know, no, never breaks in front of his family. Doesn't get involved crying. in the drama. Yeah. Yeah. Just starts crying. And it's really beautiful. I want to talk about Joe right now. He's a really great director and I've seen a number of other films from him. I've realized that he's like a master of, camera movement he has a reputation of using tracking shots a lot in his films which like i mean pride and prejudice holy moly there's so many of them but he really is just a master of storytelling through movement of the camera so one it was interesting because with that first shot with the introducing the house it's just very nice in general because it does just set the scene of this like this whole family living in this house and them just the, the girls banging around the house and making all this noise there is a cut in that scene and it's because of the lighting he was talking so much about like I wish the weather was better I wish we had the sun and it was because there's like once they go into the house they wanted to have the light coming through this window but like when they're outside of the house they wanted the light coming from this way so it's like they shot like one half of it in the morning and then they shot the other half of it like That's inside amazing. so they have the right lighting like it's just so insane you don't think about these things you don't Not even notice all. that there's a cut there and it's just insane how much work goes into it so mm -hmm. Props and the, to Joe. And like the <laughs> props to Joe. The rehearsal process for that shot must have been a lot. I really do appreciate it. I mean, they may have cut. I'm not sure if the cut happens between this, but Keira Knightley comes in the house, goes through a door, a bunch of other stuff happens, and she comes around to their backyard or something. And you know that that, that takes rehearsal. There is a later ball scene where he talks about how Kira is like he's like yeah so about at this point kira is sprinting through yes the house exactly. to get to her next spot you can't tell but she's running she was like before the shot she'd be like <laughs> yeah and then she's trying to compose herself to like <laughs> yeah like literally it's like i think it's this i think it's the scene at um the party at, at bingley's and so then it ends it's like she's in the scene and then a lot of other stuff happens and then it ends with her like kind of in semi-darkness like leaning against the wall like looking pensively off into the distance and mm -hmm. like you know that she's trying not to like breathe out yeah like, knowing uh, no, that now goodness. you can tell so much from his commentary and like you see with those big tracking shots that he loves um, that he loves movement and he loves, you know, all of that. And he was critical of himself for when um, the girls uh, or Mrs. Bennett is introducing the girls to Bingley at the first ball. Um, and he's like, I don't really like this scene. Like, I think it's really boring how we shot it. I'm really disappointed with it because it really is just like cutting back and forth between the two groups of people. It is really interesting because that does feel like a little bit of a different scene in the film. It feels like a, I, I think it works. I mean, you know, Poor Joe. I understand he may be critical of it, but I think it works so well because of just the tone of that scene. But it is interesting that you bring that up because it is such a different microcosmic scene in comparison to the rest of the film. Especially even just in comparison to that, the bigger scene that that's in, that yeah. ball, that first ball, there's just like so much going on with the camera movement and the people all over. And mm -hmm. he was talking about how like the when they're under the, the bleachers, like that whole thing, like you, mm -hmm. you can see like how in love he is with so many of these shots and then just how critical he was. He was like, and this one's boring. I don't like this one. Yeah, no, the movement is just so incredible. And it's not even those tracking shots. It's also just some shots. There's a great shot where Elizabeth Bennet is running away from Darcy and she's running and they track her this way. And then she goes down the stairs, tracks her, and it just ends on Darcy's hand, his loose like hand like sitting down. And there are so many moments like that where he just is thinking so much about where do we start? Where do we end? And how does this further the story? How does this deepen the characters in a certain way? And not only the tracking shots, but the zooms. I want to yeah, talk about the those zooms are so funny. Zooms. They're so funny and so great. There are two in particular that I love. The first one is when Darcy runs into Elizabeth's room 
and tries to talk to her and fails and leaves. Mm-hmm. But he just rushes into the room and it immediately zooms. And mm-hmm. it's a stylist, it's a stylistic choice that does not appear in the movie at all until this point, I believe. And it just hits you like a like a brick, like that moment where you're like, oh, huh. it stops moving in its tracks, heightens the tension significantly. And I think it does the exact same thing when Elizabeth is visiting Darcy's mansion and Dar- and she's peeping. Uh, when he is hugging the sister. That's the best one. That is the best one because the cutting is so good. Like, it, it's like, ha! Huh! And then immediately cuts. It's funny, but it's also, like, scary. It, like, adds tension to it. And I think it's just amazing when you have a director who knows how to make a movie stylistically different and unique throughout the film, but it all still feels like it has purpose it all still feels like you know like these dramatic zooms and these tracking shots are almost completely different from one another they serve like two completely different purposes but they're still they are full of such intentionality and they're also incredibly well done like they just feel like they feel like perfect takes I realized talking about all these tracking shots and then I realized while I was watching it, like, I wonder if that's why I love this movie so much. Again, it's just a subconscious thing, but like I have a background in theater um, and I I love anything that's really like feels like theatrical. And I think that these long shots where they're just and he's taught he Joe Wright talks about this. I think specifically the scene where they're in um, the the study when Lizzie goes to check on Jane and then she's just kind of like hanging out I guess at the house after checking in on Jane because Jane's sick at Bingley's a, a big chunk of that scene is just one shot and Joe Wright is talking about that and he was like yeah like it's, I really like doing these long shots because it's like you can just spend a lot of time rehearsing and then you know shoot it however many times and you're good as opposed to having to get all these different angles and all these different things and I think there's something it's very theatrical it's I mean that's the whole thing when you're you know for stage performances it's rehearsal and then just going and doing it um and I think I mean I you know I haven't been on a film set so I can't say but you know you know it's it's you get this shot you get this angle you do it you move on but just being able to just go and go and go and get that whole scene and like the cameras moving along with the people and like no cutting. Like, I think there's something very theatrical about that. And I wonder if that's why it like speaks to me so much, why I enjoy it so much. I think we just had a breakthrough. I think we just had a breakthrough folks. There it is. Katie, we're going to go through the MFMI lightning round now where we are going to ask you a lightning round of superlatives. You've already answered some of these questions already. So it should maybe be easy, but I really want to, uh, Test your love of this film. Favorite scene? I love the scene when she's with her aunt and uncle and they're heading to Pemberley and they're sitting under that big old tree. Favorite character and, if different, favorite performance? Lizzie Bennett, Keira Knightley. Next question. Beautiful. There aren't really songs featured in it, but there is a, but since you were talking about the score before, do you have a favorite piece of music? in the film. I think my favorite one is probably the music that plays when Darcy's crossing the the field and it's like da, 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 da. that wasn't music. This is such a trivial question now, but favorite behind the scenes know-how or piece of trivia. So, the book takes place in I don't I'm not going to get the dates right, but like early 1800s. For this movie, they aged it earlier so they went back like a decade or two and I knew this before watching the director's commentary I looked it up to find out and I was like oh okay because I was like what's the difference between the book and the movie found that out watching the director's commentary it's like the scene where it's the first ball and it's when Darcy and Bingley and Caroline first arrive and Joe Raid is like oh yeah so yeah so we um set this movie like a decade or two earlier whatever the dates he says uh, and he was like and it's really just because I don't really like the look of those Empire Waist dresses. I think they're ugly. (laughs) (laughs) And he was like, but Caroline Bingley here, you can see her in one of those dresses because at this point they were just coming out and it was like the height of fashion. But no one else is wearing them because I don't like how they look and I think they're They're ugly. ugly. That's why he changed the whole time period of the movie. (laughs) You gotta respect the commitment. You gotta respect the confidence. If you had to make a double feature... And you had to pair this film with another film. What would you pair it with? Um, it's this movie called Austin Land, um, starring uh Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, starring Carrie Russell. I love it. That's another one of my favorite movies. It's about. It's based on a book. It's about this woman who's obsessed with Jane Austen, um, and ends up going to this place called Austin Land. Um, where she's, it's supposed to be like a live action role playing type like experience. And then there's like 
love and she's like living in this time period it's just like it's it's very fun and it's cute and i love it and i think it goes very well hand in hand with pride and prejudice that's a great pick i was gonna say little women the newer Little Women, Little Women, uh, is with a great uh, one. Greta Gerwig. That movie also filled me up with such warmth. I and do. It I also, love that movie. That might also, also be another one of my many yeah. favorite movies. <laughs> also, Lizzie Bennet and Joe March, I feel like, are sort of kindred sisters. If this film were your favorite, what would have been the runner-up for this podcast? Probably Mulan. And that's also just in terms of like talking about how often I watch movies. Like you said that you don't watch a lot of your favorite movies a lot. And I think I do have a lot of favorite movies that I don't really watch. Like I say that Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is one of my favorite movies, but I really don't. Even though it is a very rewatchable movie, I haven't watched it in a while. I'm probably due for a rewatch. But Mulan, I will watch. Mulan and Enchanted. Enchanted might also be very close up there. Last one. Favorite response you've gotten from somebody when you tell them that this is your favorite movie? So I honestly don't know if I've told a lot of people this is my favorite movie because I honestly get really stressed anytime I have to talk about my favorite anything because then I feel like I'm leaving important things out. I love Pride and Prejudice. Hey, I also love Looney Tunes back in action. I'm a I'm a complicated person. And what what a what a ricochet. I think we need right do there. we need to do another episode now? Uh, about I don't know, Katie. <laughs> we may have had a missed opportunity here. But you have told people this is this is a movie you love, I assume. Yeah. Because I've gotten all my friends to watch it. But I don't think I've ever gotten any extreme reactions that were like memorable. They're just like, cool. That checks out. Probably that checks out. That's probably the most extreme reaction I've gotten. I like Pride and Prejudice. That checks yeah, out. Yeah, that checks out. Katie, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Where can people find you on the internet? Oh, I'm all over. If you want to see me um, tweet about my many movie interests, you can follow me on Katie Flies Away. I'm Katie Flies Away everywhere you look. On Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. I don't know why I didn't say TikTok first. TikTok is my biggest thing right now. Yeah, you're like TikTok famous. Um, I also have a podcast called Dearless Fira. Um, it is a fantasy radio advice show podcast. It takes place in a fantasy world. It's hosted by a wood elf named Lesfira who answers the uh, questions and gives advice to other fantastical creatures in this fantasy world. And it's really super fun. Yeah, check it out. There's six, six good episodes uh, if you're a fan of fantasy or would like to get into it. Yes, fantastic stuff. Or if you're a fan of Bridgerton. Or if you're a fan of Bridgerton. <laughs> then you might like it. I don't know. Oh it is not God. anything like Bridgerton, but maybe you'll like it. Katie, thanks. For, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of another episode of My Favorite Movie Is. And thank you so much to Katie for being on the show and talking all things Pride and Prejudice. And uh, thank you for also introducing the first ever MFMI bit or running gag with Right Bites. Uh, I really shouldn't have expected anything less, uh, but here we are. Uh, you can follow Katie on all social platforms at Katie Flies Away. She's doing great stuff on TikTok and YouTube, so be sure to follow her there. It's MFMI approved, so... There you go. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, I hope you'll check out our podcast introduction as well as our first episode of the show, which features Max Mariner talking about all things Back to the Future. You can check those out on our show page on your podcasting platform of choice, and they'll also be available on YouTube in video form. You see new audio episodes of the show go up every other Monday, but new video episodes go up that following Friday. So there's a little bit of distance there, but I think you guys have the patience to wait it out. Uh, be sure to follow, subscribe, hit that notification bell, do what you gotta do to make sure you stay updated on exactly when new episodes go live. Another way to find out if new episodes are live yet is to follow us on our social media pages at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We post sneak peeks, we post bonus content, some things exclusive to those platforms that you won't even hear in the original episode. Crazy. Uh, be sure to do that and follow us on those platforms. And while you're on those platforms or on your podcasting platforms or on YouTube, uh, give us some love, like, comment, subscribe, leave a rating, do whatever it is on whatever platform you use. Uh, it really means a lot for a show that just started and is really trying to grow and expand. Uh, spread the word, share the show with your friends, anything you can do to help show us some support. Uh, it really means the world. We see it, we love it, and we thank you. For more information about the show, as well as a full catalog of audio and video episodes, you can go to our website, mfmipodcast.com. Or if you're trying to get in touch with us, if you want to say hi, if you have a question, you can contact us at our email, hello at mfmipodcast.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.
My Favorite Movie Is is a Larry Freed Presents production. It is executive produced, hosted, created, and directed by myself, Larry Freed, and is also produced by myself alongside Brian Novak. Our assistant director is Steven Reyes, and our editors are myself, as well as Clayton and Kimberly Allen. Our graphic designer is Monica Sarmiento. Our motion graphics designer is Elton Greenfield. And our theme song, Now and Then, as well as all original music featured on this podcast, is composed and performed by Matt Gorduke. Our camera operator for this episode was Steven Reyes. Our sound recorder for this episode was Dominic Mistretta. And our production assistants for this episode were Guillaume Moissonnier and Sal Sisto. Thank you all so much for your hard work and for making this show possible. You can check out everyone's websites and social handles down below in the show notes. Until next time, my name is Larry Freed, and this has been My Favorite Movie Is. Is.